now look to Marcel Satcher, graduate officer, Exeter College, to continue the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a great honor to be able to speak in this debate alongside such prominent speakers who I deeply admire on such an important and timely issue. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members, and distinguished guests, let me begin by clearly stating that the Catholic Church has committed grave and serious errors in the handling of the sexual abuse cases. It has committed numerous sins, as the motion phrases. This debate is not one that questions such a fact, nor is this a debate about Catholicism and what theological means of redemption can pay for such sins, despite what the wording of the motion might suggest. Instead, this debate is whether or not the Catholic Church can do anything in the light of the sexual abuse cases. The proposition must prove that the church can never pay for its sins. And here I draw attention to the key word, never. That means any and all actions of the church or steps taken by the church are futile. Not only do I argue that the church can do something, but I argue that it should and that it must, which is why I urge you all to vote in opposition to the motion tonight. To convince you to vote in opposition to the motion, I will make two main arguments. First, I want to focus on the victims, on their voices, and what they ask for in light of the sexual abuse cases. I will argue that justice is what victims and survivors primarily seek, and facilitating and helping survivors find justice is the primary way the church can and should pay for its sins. I will then touch upon the church's current efforts to address the abuse cases and how, although they are insufficient, they are important steps in delivering justice. It is important to understand that nothing, nothing will be able to undo the crimes committed. Nothing will be able to change the feeling that an abuse sticks with someone for life. Nothing will change the experience of such pain, distrust and powerlessness. But yet victims and survivors are braving themselves to speak up and to demand for justice. That's what they're speaking up for. They're not speaking up to undo the crimes. They're speaking up for justice. They're demanding justice from the church. They do not simply conclude that the church can never pay for its sins. The payment they ask for is justice. But what exactly is justice? There are four forms of justice I would briefly outline Retributive, corrective, restorative, and transitional justice. In these forms of justice, the Catholic Church is an active and necessary agent required to deliver justice to victims. In retributive justice, the offender and the institution of the Church is the agent proportionately punished for its crimes. In corrective justice, the Church is the agent that must compensate or pay reparations. In restorative justice, the church is the agent that facilitates the accountability of the offenders and supports and assists victims through the healing process. Lastly, in transitional justice, the church is the agent that must admit to all its crimes, recover the truth of the past, restore the dignity of victims, and build a shared narrative with victims to reconstitute the past. Victims demand that the church take an active role in facilitating justice, in paying for its sins. Do Dr. Judith Corton's work on the clergy abuse scandals in Australia focused on concrete criteria that victims considered as necessary to say that they have found justice. And the seven criteria she found are as follows. One, the truth and its acknowledgement. Two, accountability of the Catholic Church and its hierarchy. Three, monetary compensation. Four, accountability of the sex offender. Five, an apology. Six, counseling and other services. And finally, seven, prevention of further sex crimes. This is what victims and survivors seek, and this is what the Church can, should, 
and must do to pay for its sins. The most salient reason for victims demanding an acknowledgement from the church and its hierarchy regarding the truth of the sex scandals was because the majority of victims would never have their day in court due to the statutes of limitations. Even if they were to have court hearing, victims felt that acknowledgement from the church is vital because victims and survivors had lived decades not being believed. It is important for survivors to know that the abuse is not their fault. And it is important that they find the justice they deserve. The motion at hand tonight implies that the insufficiency of the church's efforts renders all efforts futile. But this is certainly not the case, because victims and survivors demand concrete actions by the church for justice. The church can and should help victims find justice, and the fruits of real justice should prevent future crimes. This means real institutional reform is required. And this is a sentiment echoed by the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report released last year in July 2018, which stated, we don't just want this abuse punished by criminal and civil penalties, we want it not to happen at all. So can the church facilitate such justice? The grand jury found that the church is now advising law enforcement of abuse reports more promptly, that internal review processes have been established, things have changed and are changing. Exactly a week ago, Pope Francis hosted all the presidents of the Episcopal Conferences and superior generals of major religious orders in a three-day meeting that focused on the protection of minors. And the meeting provided an opportunity for church leaders to respond vigorously to the crisis by clarifying the responsibility of bishops, establishing accountability processes, and increasing transparency measures. Those were the three main topics. Of course, follow-ups are necessary. Is this sufficient? No. But are these steps in the right direction? Absolutely. The church must move from a culture of secrecy and cover-up to one of disclosure and true contrition. It must essentially learn from its own theological understanding of the sacrament of reconciliation, otherwise and more popularly known as confession. Shining a light on all its sins is the only way to rid itself of its darkness and evil. This is why to claim that it can never pay for its sins is wrong. We expect the church to pay for its sins. We expect it to deliver justice. We expect it to reform. We expect it to prevent future crimes. Hence, its current efforts, although insufficient, are not futile. Here I quote again from the Pennsylvania Grand Jury. We think it's reasonable to expect one of the greatest world religions dedicated to the spiritual well-being of over a billion people to find ways to organize itself so that the shepherds stop preying upon the flock. I conclude by reminding members about the implications of the motion at hand. Claiming that the church can never pay for its sins implies a passive stance that only, not only gives up on the church, but also on victims and survivors of sexual abuse. It gives up on the justice demanded as payment for its sins. Survivors who seek justice require the church to do better by acknowledging its mistake. They require the church to apologize. They require the church to recover the truth of past events, and they require the church to prevent future sex crimes. Voting in opposition to the motion is not voting to defend the church. It is voting to hold the church accountable. It is voting to say that the church can, should, and must do all that is possible to pay for its sins. Thank you very much.